we're looking at, or the topic is to look at from Obama to Trump, but I found myself looking a little bit further back and um, actually remembering 1999 at the WTO ministerial in um, Seattle, the famous Battle of Seattle. Uh, a number of us were there, a lot of us got um, tear gas together. <clears throat> and what, why I thought of that is that I remember very clearly the surprise <clears throat> that Bill Clinton and his environmentalist Vice President Al Gore had that, that we, the Teamsters and Turtles, were coming together um, and criticizing their trade policy, which is basically, of course, much bigger than just trade. They were truly surprised. And it, I think it's a very important place to start because uh, like many other so-called progressive leaders from, uh, you know, I would look at my own current one today, um, the, the Bill Clinton, I'll put my glasses on here so I can see properly. Bill Clinton drank the, the, the Kool-Aid of economic globalization. Uh, so basically deregulation or what they call, as you know, corporate social responsibility, handing over to the market and to the, to the global capital all the decisions or most of the decisions around the economy and, and the market, and maybe having a kinder, gentler way of dealing with it at home, but not distinguishing it much from uh, those on the right. Um, Public-private partnerships, there's very little built anymore um, that doesn't have uh, par uh, 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 private money, and of course free trade agreements, which are the heart and the the enforcement me mechanisms for the uh, the um, policies of economic globalization. <clears throat> they ba basically uh, started with conservatives. It started with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in my country. <clears throat> it was Brian Mulroney, and uh, you might not know, but pre-NAFTA, the first free trade agreement was between Mulroney and Reagan, <clears throat> called the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, and that set the table for all the rest that followed. Um, but Tony Blair picked it up with his third way, and then all of the uh, so-called progressive leaders after did, including Bill Clinton, including Obama, including my Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. And it's very interesting how he is distancing himself carefully, because he's politically smart, carefully from Trump by saying <clears throat> we're pro-free trade because we're pro-globalization, we're pro-migrants and immigrants, we welcome uh, quite, a, quite a, a large number actually um, of Syrian refugees and equality. He calls himself a feminist. Half of his cabinet are women and so on. So he has wrapped his, his support of free trade um, in, a, in, a, in a very progressive kind of language. And this, uh, he talks about being open to the world. And so it really is, it becomes quite confusing. And it reminds people say, well, what's he like? And I say, just think Obama after Bush. That's what we're dealing with, except he was on the cover of GQ. And when he went to Singapore, <clears throat> the government put out an edict that women reporters and uh, others were not to swoon in his presence. I'm not making that up. <laughs> so you'd have to ask these folks, it's been 30 years now since they presented the world with this, uh, these policies, how's it going for you? Well, let's just take a look at the fact that the United Nations has now said that the three quarters of the world's working age population is in what they call the precariat, cannot get full-time jobs, many of them working two and three. I remember being at a symposium when Bush was in, in office and somebody set, stood up and said, well, he's, he's creating lots of jobs. I myself have three of them. You know, this is the new, uh, the new way of the world. Um, and in North America, it really was cemented with the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is what I want to take a couple of moments to, to speak about, because I've been spending a fair amount of time on it. As you know, we're going through this renegotiation. It entrenched, not by itself, but with these other policies, massive job loss in manufacturing in Canada and the U.S., massive farm lo job loss in Mexico, and the manufacturing jobs that were created there, of course, were low wage. Wage stagnation in all of our countries, decline in unions in all of our countries, family debt in all of our countries, uh, and the creation of a precariat here in North America. And of course, you know the statistics on the soaring inequality. It's worse here in the US, but it's really bad in my country. And in fact, in the 10 years after the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was signed, child poverty in our country grew the fastest of any OECD country. I mean, we just went from what I call an egg with a large middle class and a very small uh, you know, working poor even at the bottom and very small group of 
wealthy people um, to more like a, a pair. That's how Canada is shaped, and it happened really quickly. <clears throat> NAFTA, of course, also introduced us to ISDS, the Investor State D Dispute Settlement. It's Chapter 11, and this means that for the first time, corporations were able to bypass their own governments and sue directly the, the governments of, of other countries. There have been 85 challenges under NAFTA, 40 against Canada. We've lost a whole bunch. Uh, we've, we're now facing $2.6 billion worth of challenges from American corporations, uh, two-thirds of that for environmental, higher environmental standards, such as a moratorium that the province of Quebec put on um, fracking under the Great Lake, or, or under the St. Lawrence. So um, we're seeing the, 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 the d destructive uh, uh, outcome of the, the, this terrible corporate-friendly uh, 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 clause of, of NAFTA. And since then, in a very short time this has happened, over 3,500 bilateral investment agreements have been signed between countries that con contain ISDS. And, Large corporations from mostly wealthy countries are using this power to bring poor countries to their knees. It's absolutely a devastating thing that was introduced in NAFTA and our governments are still promoting. So what did Hillary Clinton come, uh, propose when she came along uh, and didn't mention NAFTA? And she did say that she would back away from the TPP, but that's just because it was so unpopular here in the United States. And I think what happened, and I, uh, John alluded to it, when someone came along and said, I hear your pain. I know that you know the manufacturing sector's been hollowed out. I know that whole communities have been hollowed out. I know what it feels like. I think a lot of people just held their noses and did not vote for the man. They voted for somebody who noticed them. And I really think we have to, to deal with that. <clears throat> yes, there are the deplorables that Hillary Clinton talked about, but I don't think we can say that everyone who voted for Trump um, would support him on, on, on many other of his, of his policies. So now we're in these negotiations, very deep into them. You should know that the United States is asking for concessions that no country could give. I mean, they're asking for what they're calling about five or six poison pills that they know cannot, uh, cannot work. And it, we don't know if it's a, a ploy on the part of Trump or if Trump is thinking that any moment he'll just walk away or if, uh, if, it's, if it's a game <clears throat> or what's on his mind on that particular day. But basically, and we've been told by Canadian negotiators that the American negotiators tell them over a drink at night, we haven't any idea what to ask for because the, the rules keep changing and the demands keep changing. But basically, they have asked for a bunch of concessions that they're not willing to give, way more opening of Buy America policies and protections here in the United States, but Canada and Mexico have to open up their procurement, uh, different rules of origin to give the United States much greater uh, power in, in terms of auto and, and other manufacturing. So um, it, at the moment, <clears throat> they're at an impasse. There's no way this thing is going to move ahead under the current circumstance. I do want to warn us, and I don't want to talk about climate for one minute, about a very dangerous part of NAFTA that if NAFTA does go ahead, will be contained. And that is that they're going to extend or they want to extend the proportionality clause of the chapter on energy to Mexico. And this is the clause where Canada agreed in the original NAFTA <clears throat> to share, uh, give up sovereignty over our oil and gas and to not only, not only we, did we deregulate the conditions under which we sold exported um, oil and gas, but we signed a proportionality clause which basically says we have to continue sending our energy south and we can only stop whether it's shortages or wanting to convert away from fossil fuels or away from the tar sands in Alberta to a more friendly energy regime, we would have to cut back for ourselves. So basically, if it goes ahead and Mexico does sign and the right-wing Mexican government has liberalized, privatized its energy sector, now this would lock it in. We are locking, this new NAFTA, NAFTA II, would be locking North America into a fossil fuel future. It's extraordinarily dangerous and it would be almost impossible for any of our countries to meet climate uh, uh, our climate commitments. And it's important to note that even though Trump has walked away from the Paris Agreement and our government endorsed it uh, very, very strongly and, and was in Paris th two years ago saying all sorts of the right things, moving from two degrees to 1.5, it makes no difference. If we are locked into this future, it doesn't matter what the politicians say, we simply cannot meet these climate uh, agreements. So I want to make that distinction that it's one thing to say that, but another to, to, to 
to uh, sign an agreement that has the kind of power that these trade agreements have. There is no agreement that we sign <clears throat> internationally, whether it's on climate change or on human rights or anything else that has the power that trade and investment agreements have. They have enforcement abilities that no other, no other international treaties have. And therefore, they act as a kind of um, uh, uh, structure or new, new construction uh, around uh, deregulation and privatization. And it's the lack of understanding of how those policies are in total contradiction to more progressive policies that I believe got the Democrats in trouble in the first place and have led us to where we are. So I just want to end, though, with a moment of hope, because I actually think this NAFTA is going to unravel, and with it will unravel ISDS. And this ISDS provision is in trouble around the world. There was so much opposition to TTIP, which was the European-American agreement that was being negotiated till Trump pulled out. Uh, that the European Commissioner has said this probably the one with Canada, CETA, will probably be the last agreement Europe ever signs that contains an investor state provision. And this is an incredible win. I mean, we had people, we had marches in Europe where half a million people came out in Berlin, for instance, against TTIP and CETA. I mean, acronyms that most people don't in, in North America don't even know about. They, they, they are knowledgeable. It was such a passionate debate. And th this investor state provision is being challenged in countries around the world, from India to Australia to Brazil to Bolivia and so on. So I believe that there's a moment, although it came out of a bad process and a bad man, as Stephanie so clearly articulated, and yes, our movement has to very clearly articulate our very different perspectives, our different analysis, and our different uh, solutions than, than, than that of, of, of Donald Trump. Nevertheless, I think we're at a moment when we can start to build. You should know that Trans-Pacific Partnership is not dead. Um, just because Trump pulled out doesn't mean the other countries aren't moving ahead with it. They're assuming that either he'll be gone in three years or you know, somebody, a sensible Republican or, or a pro-trade uh, Democrat will get back in and, and all will be as it should be again. So please don't think the trade agenda has gone away. It hasn't, but we have a moment here. And I just want to end with a word of solidarity to <clears throat> all of you, because I know it's tough. We just, uh, we had a former prime minister, Stephen Harper, who uh, wasn't as, um, un I don't, I say this politely, as unbalanced, uh, perhaps, as, <clears throat> as your president, but he was really awful. He t pulled us out of Kyoto. He gutted the three most important water laws we had, protecting water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He, he muzzled our scientists. He was just terrible. And we went through some, you know, 10 years of a, a really hard time. And so I just want to say to you that we'll get over this. Like, he will be gone one day, and we will come back to... Um, we will have an opportunity to dream the dreams that we have. And it's really important. This cross-border work that we do is extraordinarily important. And just to leave you with the, the words of a 95-year-old friend of mine, when <clears throat> many of us get weary in our struggles, she says, oh, you young people. And she says, by that, she means anyone under 85. You know, she, we all love her for that. She says, you, you know, fighting for justice isn't like putting on a, an outfit and you take off. You do it every day. And when she gets real upset, she says, you do it every day or you stink. Thank you so much.